All right, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to Real Bravo Fine Art Gallery. I'm Kara Jack Augustine. I'm your current Arts Council President. It's an honor to welcome you here to the gallery. Our artist today has lived in New York for some 35 years. He's originally from Minnesota. He moved here in 2006 and he studied art at the University of Minnesota at Moorhead. Give a warm welcome to artist Gregory Montroy. Hello everybody and uh, thank you for coming and thank the Sierra Arts Council for inviting me and Rio Bravo for hosting the, the talk. I'm going to mostly be sitting in the back running the slides and talking from there and, uh, and if there's questions we can ask at the end maybe. Thank you. My talk is Convergent Paths, My Life and My Artwork, The Role of Intuition, Serendipity and Risk, that have, that have, the role that they have played in my life and my artwork. And kind of looking uh, at my trajectory of my art and my life, I find that really the idea of serendipity has played a really important uh, and surprising role. And I think that it's, uh, the idea of serendipity is really like finding something inadvertently and accidentally finding something good. And it has been kind of a guiding principle for both my art and my life. So that's me, and I was born in Crookston, Minnesota, a very isolated place in the center of the United States near the Canadian border. It's very flat, with wide open spaces, and Winnipeg is the nearest big city. It's three hours away. And the first big city that I saw in person was Calgary, Canada, and I was on a family vacation when I was 14 years old. So I was really like, you know, I was in, from a small town, and I visited other small towns, but I never really like visited the city for a long time. So that's a photo of downtown Crookston. Uh, it has a population of 7,800, and it has a lot in common sort of with two of the consequences. The two main streets are Broadway and Main, <laughs> and uh, the climate is extreme. <laughs> and growing up there, my view of the world was quite limited. Uh, I never visited a museum until I was 16 on a high school trip when we went to the Guthrie Theater to see a play. And so it's kind of unlikely that I became an artist because I wasn't really exposed to art, you know, very much growing up. Uh, as a child, I always liked to draw. Not really what I saw around me, more a fascination with making lines. And in high school I took painting and ceramics classes, and I decided to apply to the University of Minnesota at Moorhead, across the river from Fargo, North Dakota. I was accepted into the art program. Uh, I started in ceramics, but I didn't like the professor, so I switched to painting. <laughs> and my paint, this is a picture of my painting instructor. Uh, he had a big influence on me, he did not push his painting style on his students, but encouraged exploring many different ways of painting. His openness was admirable, and in 1979, when I was a junior, he suggested that I visit New York City. So his name was Timothy Ray, and that's some of his artwork there. This, was a, this is an image from my senior exhibition at the University of Minnesota Moorhead. Uh, that's me and my sister. And in the 70s, there was a lot of interest in structuralism, and semiotics, so the, sign, the study of signs and symbols. And I was interested in structure and in the limits of chaos and freedom uh, with these works. I think that these ideas have remained a constant in my work. And following are a few details from the exhibition. So this piece, there's, there are pieces of, of uh, burlap that are covered with plaster and they're attached with strings and then they're suspended away from the wall. And so it's kind of the idea of a kind of exploded grid. And that's a very early piece of mine that was in my senior exhibition. This is another piece that also deals with the grid, kind of, you know, a, a kind of loose, chaotic formation that's kind of contained by the grid. And this is a larger piece, uh, sort of the same, in the same thing. And I was also, and still am, into music. It gave me clues to the world beyond Crookston. 
uh, starting as a maybe 10, a 12 year old or something. And I pursued music while I was at university as a fan, uh, as a fun mode of expression. This is a photo of me with a group called the Negligence. <laughs> with fellow art students and musicians. And the person with the keyboard is my roommate, Eugene Hanchett. And he was, a, he was a music major. And a lot of the other people are art students. And uh, I'm the one kind of right behind Eugene there. And uh, our room was, our dorm room was filled with music, hundreds of LPs. And I believe that it was through exploring music that I discovered chaos theory. The idea that, that within complex chaotic systems of apparent randomness, there are underlying patterns. And much of my artwork has been a pursuit to reveal these underlying patterns. And musicians like Brian Eno, The Velvet Underground, and John Cage made use of these techniques. And there are parallels in art history with Hans Arp and the Dada movement. And um, this always kind of informed my work. And also, I had a very excellent art history teacher at the uh, University of Minnesota Moorhead. Her name was Virginia Barsh. She was a nun, and she had three degrees, English, chemistry, and art history. And she was really the most amazing teacher. So these are some of my art student colleagues also, who were in this band also. And um, my painting teacher in 1979, said we should think about going to New York. So this guy on the left is kind of in the blur, Matt Barron, uh, was an art student. We decided to take a Greyhound bus from Fargo to New York City for our Christmas break, 1979. And so uh, it was quite an adventure. Mm -hmm. And so we arrived in New York and we stayed with some friends, uh, another art student who had, no, was a musician, who had graduated the year before. And we stayed with him and his uh, wife on 12th Street between Avenue A and B in Manhattan uh, in an apartment with a bathtub in the kitchen, which is kind of typical in the East Village at the time. And if you just keep this address in mind, because it will come up later in the talk. And when I came to New York, one of, one of the impetuses for visiting New York was I had read an article in Time magazine about the retrospective of the German artist Joseph Weiss was at the Guggenheim Museum. And seeing this show was kind of earth shattering for me because he used really unusual materials for his art and it was based on a kind of personal mythology about his plane had crashed and these people had kind of covered him in fat and felt and saved him, saved him from uh, dying. And so he used materials like fat and felt and uh, and it really opened my eyes to the idea of a broader definition of art, seeing this exhibition when I was in New York on this trip. And, um, and he also really studied, he also really was interested in like the magical properties of materials, and he did performances also. And his, his main impetus was really like trying to heal the earth or the world through his art. So that's a piece of his, it's called Fat Chair from 1964. When I got back to Moorhead after the trip to New York, one of my classes, I don't remember which one exactly, they showed this film, it was called 14 Americans, Directions of the 70s, and it was a film about artists of the you know, current time, because this was probably like 1978, 79. And so I saw this film by Michael Blackwood, and the artist that was most interested in the film uh, was Laurie Anderson. She did both visual and performance art, and so, I wrote her a letter and asked her if I could become an intern. And she wrote back. So then, uh, that's her postcard. So she wrote back and she said yes. And so she did both visual performance art. And by the time I arrived for my internship, she had a number two single on the UK charts. What time? Because she was really like, she, you know, she was known, but she didn't have any like kind of off music, commercial music at the time. And so when I went there, it was really like the time that she was recording an album for Warner Brothers. And I went to a lot of recording sessions at the Hit Factory. I had all the equipment in to get music and stories and things like that. And so the internship was an amazing opportunity. And I went to recording sessions. And it was an unpaid internship. So I asked if she knew of any job possibilities. And she made some phone calls, and I got an interview, 
and eventually I got a paid internship at the kitchen. And she was on the board of the kitchen, and the kitchen was this amazing, and it still exists today, it's a kind of an amazing experimental music, dance, performance, and art space in New York. And so I got this internship at the kitchen, and working for this kind of premier cultural institution of contemporary music, video, dance, and performance, and visual art was a dream come true. I'm still close friends with many of my colleagues from this time period, and uh, it was really like a, such a great opportunity because I got to, I got to go to all the performances and see all the exhibitions and video things for free, and so it was really like such a amazing opportunity. And then you know, was really around a lot of really interesting artists, and so I was really so lucky to get this job. And I worked there for like you know, maybe three or four years. And, and I had different functions, like I was an intern, I worked for the touring part department, I did different things. I did the box office, so I could invite my friends to come for free. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then soon after this, after I started to get to the kitchen, I think I met someone and they said, oh, you, should, you could be in an exhibition in the East Village. And so, some of my first things that I showed in the East Village were, in some ways, now that I look back at it, it's probably kind of influenced by Joseph Boyce. He worked a lot with cross shapes and things too. And so this is a sketch for the piece, and then this is the final piece. And so this was one of the first things I ever exhibited in New York. It's called Double Cross. <laughs> and, um, and so that was kind of my very first exhibition I remember. I wrote, I found in my journal, like I wrote about my first opening and what I thought of it. <laughs> And so it's really interesting to look back. And so, uh, and then not long after this, I was offered, by chance also, um, I went to visit, I went with someone I was working with to see a friend of a friend, and I noticed the building had like brand new windows and stuff, which was unusual, because this was the neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, I asked about the building, and the woman said, oh, it's a special kind of building um, that the city of New York owned because the people didn't pay taxes, and we're looking for ten, or for we're, we're looking for people to buy, and it was very inexpensive. And so I kind of jumped on the opportunity, and it was not really like a very glamorous neighborhood, as you can see, but it was uh, still it was really a very you know kind of amazing stroke of luck because I suddenly had a stable place to live that wasn't too expensive. It was just one of the most important things when you're in New York. And so this is another artwork from that time period. Yeah. And this is the building I lived in for over 33 years. Wow. And so I had one small apartment in the back, and eventually I was able to buy the apartment next door so I could make expand my studio. But I always even used, even when I only had three rooms, I always used the biggest room for my studio. And, uh, and because we owned this building collectively, all the people who, who lived there, we really made efforts to sort of make the block nicer, to kind of like become vested in improving the, the neighborhood and stuff. And so there was a community garden across the street that I was very involved in, and then there was uh, the building itself and the block. And so this is some of the work I did in my first studio there in New York. What street was it on? It was on 12th Street, between Avenue A and Avenue B. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it was called the Alphabet City, sort of. And so it's <laughs> and it was, you know, it was kind of a rough neighborhood, but you know, you just had to keep your radar up when you walked around. And, and so, so I lived on this block for 31 years, and I became involved in, improve, in improving things. And as I was in New York longer, I think that I was affected really by like the art I was seeing in galleries and things, and my environment, the city. And so I think that these works really like are kind of, you know, for me, that's about like silhouettes of the sky against the silhouette of all the buildings and things like that. And so, this is some artworks from this time period, the early time period. These are early pastels. And I think I was like, I was really kind of like into Elizabeth Murray at the time. She did a lot of shaped paintings and things. And so, this is another one. So I think it was kind of like, my urban environment was seeping in during those times. This is the 18 by 24 inch pastel. 
And then, uh, not so long after I moved into the building, I was able to... Not so long after moving into the building, I was able to have an art, another uh, art student friend from uh, Moorhead. I was help, able to help her buy an apartment in the building too. And so we became kind of fast friends, and, um, and this has led to a lifelong, uh, amazing shared collaboration on many, many levels. And she's still one of my closest friends. And uh, she lives mostly in Minneapolis now. And her name is Carrie Pickett, and she's a photographer and a filmmaker. And so, and this funny photo is funny because in Marseille, this friend of ours, we went to see an exhibition together, and it was an artist that was at the museum in Marseille. And if you look, like Crookston is in the picture, and uh, let's see, Crookston is up there, and she's from Little Falls. Mm -hmm. And they, and our friend circled the building and then put the picture in the book that she published. And this is 12th Street between Avenue A and Avenue B. After we did some improvements, got some trees. There was not a single tree on the block. And we really did a lot for the block and the building and the garden and stuff. And so really, it turned much nicer after some time period of working on it, improving it. And then in 1991, um, I was invited uh, to New Mexico for the first time by Yves Musar, the dancer, who's here. And I was doing the set for his performance at the Center for Contemporary Art in Santa Fe. And that was our very first trip to New Mexico. And here's a picture of him performing. And after this performance, we had friends in Tucson. And so we thought we'd go camping in October. <laughs> Almost froze to death. But we got on our way to Tucson, and that's the very first time that we discovered Truth or Consequence in 1991. And so, and so here we are now. So like, once again, you know, this kind of serendipity, like you're not really looking for this thing, and then it just, you know, it, it kind of appears, and, and uh, I'm still here. And then short, uh, even before this, I, I had a really amazing dealer in New York that I shared with for many, many years. And I really had dozens of shows, uh, solo shows and group shows with him. And his name was Julian Preto. And I shared with him until he passed away in 1995. And he had three small spaces in Soho at the time. But uh, he was really very instrumental in, in uh, you know, helping my career and placing a lot of important artworks and, and important collections. And, and so he was really like a, a very big supporter. That's him, that's Julian Preda, when he was younger. And uh, I still miss him. And then he's some other works that I showed while I was showing with Julian. So that's my studio with some works ready to go to an exhibition. And I think some of, you know, one or two of these are here, I think, in the gallery. And during this time period, when I was working on the ones with the with this thread, like, this, like these. These are very chance-based works where I would like decide on the elements and then I would like dip a uh, different size thread or yarn in paint and throw it from heights onto the canvases. And so they were very unpredictable and there were really a lot that wouldn't turn out. So I decided to kind of counter the, the unpredictability with much more predictable micro decisions that would kind of build to make something that was more certain. And I would do them both at the same time in a way almost as a kind of counteract uh, one to the other. And then it was a kind of really interesting way to kind of, uh, you know, not put all your eggs in one basket, more or less. <laughs> so here's another painting that I was using the silhouettes of stones. And uh, in a lot of my work, it's really the space in between things that's almost more important than the, than the positive space. This is kind of a large painting, like six feet square. And I also did a lot of works on paper. This is a small drawing, uh, kind of accumulation of very small, small marks. Some I did with a brush, sometimes I would use a tiny, tiny sponge, and you know, this, the, uh, some of my earlier things. And then, I kind of, at a certain point, I wanted to work with a brush again. But I once again kind of always work in a very risky way, and so I would, 
you know, make the whole background wet, and then I would kind of attack the painting with a brush and marks, but it was very iffy because you had sort of one shot. You couldn't really go back and fix it. You couldn't really erase it. You couldn't really, so it was, in a way, and this is a very large painting. And so I've always worked in a way that's kind of like high risk, but I think that it puts the pressure on to kind of like uh, make something appear more immediately. And then this is another one that I was working, uh, kind of gestural abstraction with brushwork. And uh, I'm happy with this one. And then I worked in the hall for probably 10 or 15 years. I decided to kind of eliminate color and just work in black and white. And I did a lot of works on paper, a lot of small canvases some large canvases too, and then I would also do collages and use elements like newsprint or foil or, and so these are some of my small paintings, gestural paintings. And for the titles, I'd often use things I'd over here on the street like, where are you? Uh, what time is it? <laughs> Just things that I would over here walking around New York, and so I was like, had a notebook with me, and I would copy down the things I overheard, and then I would just like, try to kind of connect them to a painting later on in my studio. And during this time period, through my painting teacher, Timothy Ray, I was visiting him in Moorhead, Minnesota, which is across the river from Fargo, and he introduced me to the woman who was in charge of the Rourke Museum. And just out of the blue, she said, oh, how would you like to have a solo exhibition at the Rourke Museum? And so that was really a thrill. And so I had a solo exhibition in 2013 at the Rourke Museum. And it was like, uh, it was my first you know, solo museum show. And they did like a poster that was all over town. And then my university magazine did this big uh, cover piece on me and the exhibition. And that was kind of nice because it was also because it was near where I'm from, I could invite my parents to see the show, and a lot of relatives came and stuff, and they'd never seen so many shows in So this is a piece from that time period, and was in that show, collage. And for the collage, sometimes I like to use elements from a newspaper, but it would be like kind of mundane parts of the newspaper, like stock market pages or obituary, you know, sort of like, not really like news story, so much more of this like a kind of, background in time kind of thing. And then I was asked to give a uh, commission to do a piece in Oakland, California at Pro Arts Gallery. And for this piece actually it was an exterior window that was sort of near the city hall uh, and then the gallery had another exhibition inside. And so I wanted to try and engage the public and so for the text, this is at night, for the text it's kind of like a mirrored text and people would see themselves reflected in the text, and it says limitless, and then there was a selection of my paintings on the inside. And this is after I started to work more with color, um, after I was spending more time in Marseille and New Mexico. And this is one from that time period. I think it was in the room. And this is my studio in Marseille. Um, where I really kind of dived head first into color because I think because of the light and the environment it's really like it's near the sea and it's much more open than New York was and so this is a selection of things I was working on in my studio in Marseille maybe a year and a half ago. And this is a recent painting also from, uh, that I did in Marseille but it's here in the This is a work on paper from Crusoe. This is the most recent painting. I, had, I was offered a solo exhibition at a, a, a gallery in Marseille in uh, Le Cabousier building, who's a kind of a very known architect. And it was really interesting to work in this building because it gave you a reason to go there often, and it's such a thoroughly thought out building. And so this is one of the paintings that I exhibited in that show. And I'm using some newsprint again on, this is an oil on canvas with newsprint. 
So that's kind of a different amount because I used to just do the newsprint on paper. What size is that? This one is about, um, you know, about, let's see, 24 by 30, maybe something like that. Thick. It's not really big, it's kind of medium size. And then this is a recent one that I did here in New Mexico, and it was in an exhibition here at the gallery, my last solo show here at the gallery, and also was in the exhibition that was up in Santa Fe. And, uh, this one is a large painting, this one is like uh, 48 by 60 inches. And so I really got much more into color now since I've left New York. And this one is also, this is one I did in Marseille, kind of quite recently, and um, this one is a large painting too. And I, I find that color is so fascinating because it's so unpredictable. You think one color will look good next to another and it's not true and then you have to try something else. And so I really, really got into color and so that's my, my latest uh, endeavor. And uh, that might be the last image, but my next solo show will be here at the gallery in March 2023.